economy and sustainability, organized by the Postscape Research Project and sponsored by STUE, which is a profiling area of Danbury University. Today's lecture is delivered to us by Academy of Finland Research Fellow Derek Ruess, who will be talking about, talking about the politics of compassionate urbanism. So without further ado, please, Derek. Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I've been attending the, the other lectures in the series and I found it really, really interesting. So I feel really lucky to get to get to participate myself. Um, and, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, and so as Nico says, and as the, the title indicates there, I'm gonna be talking about the, the politics of compassionate urbanism. Um, and so I'm gonna sort of lecture for a while. Um, and at any point if you have questions, feel free to ask. Um, we'll, we'll pause for a minute kind of in the middle to have some discussion. Um, and then we'll have some questions and discussions at the end, hopefully. Um, so that's the, that's the plan. Um, and just to say a little bit about what's in the background in that photo there, um, that is an image from the Louisville, Kentucky airport. Um, it sort of welcomes you when you arrive, um, noting the city's compassionateness. Um, it says Louisville is an inclusive city committed to giving back and paying it forward. We get more done together in the community when advocating for others. Our citizens show up to show the world just how much we care. Um, and, and so I've been interested in this, this idea of the compassionate city for a long time, partly because I'm from Louisville originally, um, and there's been a um, city mayor there for the past decade or so who's been pushing this idea of Louisville as a compassionate city, and has been also sort of trying to promote this, this idea of of the compassionate city elsewhere as sort of something for other, other cities to, to emulate. Um, and so that's kind of where my, my interest in this came from originally. Um, I'll say more about that as we, as we go along. Um, and so um, you probably hear, you probably heard about sort of people talking about the smart city or the sustainable city. We used to hear quite a bit about the creative city um, and, but you might not have come across um, the compassionate city, or it might not be quite as, as familiar. Um, and, and sort of compassion enters into um, urban political policy and planning discourse in a range of, of ways. And, and my project is sort of focused on a network of cities um, that have affiliated themselves with an international charter for compassion. Um, and that, that international charter um, was the outcome of a 2008 TED Prize, and TED being kind of the, the TED Talks TED, um, that was given to public religion scholar Karen Armstrong um, that sort of pitches compassion as a um, value shared amongst the world's spiritual and ethical traditions um, and points to compassion as kind of a key disposition to cultivate, to create a more just and peaceful world. Um, and the idea of sort of compassionate cities isn't contained in the charter itself, but it's something that was developed afterward as this idea that cities would sort of sign on to this um, kind of vision statement um, and, and start being more, more compassionate. Um, and there's about um, 90 cities or so that have, yeah, 90 cities or so that have um, affirmed the charter in some way or another. Um, and, there, and there are projects um, affiliated with the Charter for Compassion ongoing in um, about 300 other cities around the world. Um, and this started in, in the US and, and the bulk of the cities are in the US, about um, more than half of them, um, but the rest are in, in many other parts of the world as well. Um, yeah. And I quickly wanna make a few acknowledgements. Um, including um, some people that I've been thinking together with issues um, related to this. Um, people I've written articles together or people I'm currently writing together with. Um, uh, Trishna Parekh, Ekramul Islam, Sali Okala, and Kirsti Kalio. Um, and so if there's anything good, anything that you like in this presentation today, chances are they have something to do with that. Um, whereas if there's anything else, um, that's probably all, all me. Um, and I also want to acknowledge sort of the people who talked to me for this project. Um, a number of folks in, in Louisville, where I did kind of a, a case study that I'm going to be talking about. 
um, including sort of social and racial justice activists in the city, as well as um, people who are involved in this compassionate city network around the world that I've that I've been speaking to. And I also want to thank the the Academy of Finland for for funding this. It was my postdoctoral project. Um, and so when I talk to people about compassion, um, it tends to get kind of a polarized response. Um, for, for some people, it sort of um, seems like an obvious good. Why wouldn't you want cities to be more compassionate? Um, for others, it kind of immediately sort of puts up people's um, defenses, their kind of critical instincts, like what, what, is, what are you even talking about? Um, and, and looking at the, the literatures in urban geography and critical urban studies, um, one comes across a number of kind of critical concerns about compassion. And I've kind of tried to sum up four different, four different things here. Um, the idea that compassion is kind of a, a private um, response um, that's sort of insufficient or complicit um, to, uh, as an alternative to sort of public welfare provisioning or, or deeper kinds of, of redistribution. Um, there's, there's also a sense in which compassion can imply a um, unequal power relationship between sort of the, the giver and, and receiver of compassion, um, kind of a relationship of, of care and control. Um, and there's been a lot of research on this in um, service provisions for um, communities that have been marginalized, um, services for people without homes, for example. There's been a lot of this sort of detailing of this relationship between care and, and, and control that sometimes comes along with um, supposedly compassionate initiatives. Um, there's also lots of work talking about the way that compassion can um, rely on and reinforce existing kind of prejudices or, or inequalities, sort of who we might feel compassionate to toward um, is sort of shaped by all of the sort of biases that shape um, everything else that we do. Um, and, and so that's kind of important to keep in mind. Um, and all the ways that compassion is often invoked to sort of depoliticize relations of, of injustice. Um, so if you think of, for example, about um, questions around migration and borders, um, people seeking refuge, whether we think about those as, a, as an issue of compassion or if we think about kind of the um, unequal global relationships that lead to people needing to move to begin with um, and sort of the res where the responsibilities for those, those things lie. You can end up with very a very different kind of different kind of story. Um, so that's that's kind of a, a starting point, and I should say that I think most of these or all of these are are basically right, and they all have importance. Um, they all shed important kind of light on what's happening with the compassionate city, but I don't think they quite tell the whole story. Um, and so to understand what's going on here, I think we have to look at kind of this a broader kind of boom in public interest in compassion um, that we can see kind of across religious, scientific, therapeutic, um, management context, um, across a number of professional settings, in education, um, for example. Um, and sort of, you can sort of see there, I have some book covers, um, self-help books, um, uh, scientific research, um, awakening compassion at work, um, people arguing that compassion will make businesses more, more productive, um, that, that sort of thing. Um, there's been a lot of sort of these compassion cultivation trainings that have been developed in recent years. Um, and we'll talk more about, about those in a little bit. It's also, again, um, very, a very common sort of thing to see in, in interfaith activism, for example. Um, this idea of compassion is something shared amongst um, religious traditions. Um, that, that's also an important aspect of this. And specifically kind of that, that intersection of, of the religious and the sort of scientific is important. Um, and I should add that sort of much of this interest in compassion moves in some of the same networks and the same circles as um, interest in mindfulness. Um, and they're often sort of studied together. Um, Many of these sort of training protocols incorporate different kinds of mindfulness practices and, and ways to think about uh, ways to sort of practice compassion at the same time. So those things often end up going together. And so that's, I think, important to, to note. Um, and so I just want to briefly um, gesture towards some of the academic literatures 
that I've been engaging with with the project. Um, and there's, there's quite a few different angles. Um, but I just kind of narrowed it down to the ones that are most relevant for, for what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and the first have to do with kind of urban imaginaries and um, affective investments. Um, sort of interested in sort of the urban imaginaries of the, of the good city, um, what sort of a, a good city looks like, um, these kinds of development agendas that are couched in terms of these sort of super, superficially kind of uncontroversial, obviously sort of good things, at least again, superficially, um, smartness, sustainability, creativity, compassion, um, and sort of thinking about what's going on there and th their role in which people sort of form um, affective investments in um, existing arrangements in cities. So questions about how do people get attached or not to existing arrangements, um, as well as sort of how are potentially critical energies um, incorporated into prevailing arrangements. Um, and so there's a number of different scholars that have been important for me here. Lauren Berlant is one um, in particular. Um, Luke Boltonski and Eva Chiapello have also written um, some interesting stuff about sort of the, the spirit of capitalism that, that engages with sort of how, um, how people get attached um, to these sort of unequal arrangements that might otherwise be kind of nonsensical and unappealing. Um, what's, what's going on there? Um, so that's one set of, set of questions. There's also um, kind of urban political economy issues, kind of traditional um, stuff from urban geography, um, uh, urban studies about urban entrepreneurialism, um, policy boosterism and, and city branding, um, how cities are often sort of competing for, for investment, um, competing in lots of, lots of ways actually, um, and sort of what, what thinking about what that leads to and thinking about how this, this compassionate city discourse fits into that. Um, thinking about discourses across various contexts about um, welfare retrenchments, um, about the, the intersections of philanthropy and, and capitalism, um, and what the um, Insight um, Women of Color Collective has talked about as the, the nonprofit industrial complex, um, and, and thinking about those, those issues um, and something that comes up when, when thinking about the, the compassionate city. And also, as was kind of highlighted in the, one of the assigned readings, for those of you who are taking the course for, for credit, um, thinking about the, the political, the sort of the, the meaning and the specificity of the political, as well as sort of how things are depoliticized or repoliticized, um, which becomes kind of an important question in terms of thinking about the, the compassionate city. Um, and then thirdly, um, thinking about um, scholarship around racial capitalism. Um, and, and the concept of racial capitalism is um, I think most often associated with the work of Cedric Robinson, um, who in, in Black Marxism kind of offers this um, powerful account of the historical development of, of capitalism um, and the way that it sort of depended on pre-existing and, and sort of emerging social differentiations, divisions, and hierarchies um, that were in provided by kind of provided by racism, basically. Um, and so this sort of emphasis on the, the kind of inextricable links between um, capitalism and racism um, is in contrast to sort of some understandings of capitalism that have circulated on both the left and the right that would see racism as kind of incidental to capitalism, um, even perhaps as something that, that capitalism's own internal dynamics might um, inevitably overcome. And the sort of the specifics of Rob Robinson's account are, are more than we can get into here. Um, but for our purposes, I want to take away sort of the, um, the idea of the sort of mutual constitution of um, racialization and capitalism across multiple spaces, spheres, and scales. Um, and of course, it's going to emerge in different ways in different places. Um, and there are a number of different angles that you can look at this from that, that urban scholars have looked at this from. Um, thinking about racial colonial regimes of property and power and how those sort of persist and shape the present. Um, thinking specifically about issues around um, prisons, policing and war making and the kind of state violence that creates the conditions for, um, for the capitalist economic, um, capitalist economies to function. Um, as well as questions about sort of labor and mobility and exploitation across an uneven world. 
And I think some of this kind of came up a little bit for those of you who were here in Daria's talk, the first lecture in this series, um, that, that particular angle, um, and also in, again, in the reading um, for folks who have taken the, the course, um, kind of helps to situate racial capitalism in relation to sort of um, neoliberal urbanisms um, in a useful, useful way, I think. Um, and so in thinking about where we're going, what we sort of talked through the, the introduction, um, then I'm going to introduce sort of two, um, two different angles on the compassionate city, one about politicizing compassion, um, the other about problematizing compassion. Um, and then I'll conclude with the reflection about um, abolition and, and the possibilities of, of abolishing compassion and what that might, what that might look like. Um, so again, the first we're sort of thinking about um, how these compassionate city commitments um, get politicized, um, sort of what they what they do for the people who are sort of making them, um, what people in the, in the city might do in reaction to them. Um, and starting in in Louisville again, um, which declared itself a compassionate city in um, 2011, and has often been talked about as a kind of model city. Um, both people in Louisville have talked about themselves that way, but then I've also, in, in talking with people in the Compassionate City Networks, they have very often mentioned Louisville, Louisville to me as a, as a model that they're, that they're looking at. Um, just put a map up there so you can sort of see where, where Louisville is. It's sort of on the, the northern edge of what's considered the U.S. South. Um, and the mayor, current mayor, is... Still, the, the mayor, Greg Fisher, is going to come up quite a bit as one actor who's been, um, been uh, promoting this compassionate city agenda, um, as well as kind of a more grassroots group called the Partnership for a Compassionate Louisville. Um, those will come up again. Um, I also wanted to note a couple of things about sort of city government in, in Louisville and in the U.S. more broadly that might be kind of unique or different. Um, the, the mayor in a city like Louisville is kind of a, a powerful, directly elected actor. Um, city governments have different sets of, of functions, um, and policing, for example, is one major one that, that we're going to talk about. And in other places, of course, policing might be more of a national thing or it might be organized differently. But um, here, a lot of policing is organized at the local um, city government scale. Um, and also, there is a sense in which um, City governments can sometimes have more space to, to contest or contradict um, national government policies than in some other contexts due to kind of the, the distribution of powers between the federal government and state governments in the, in the U.S. So sometimes it's not uncommon for cities to kind of do their own thing in a range of, in a range of ways. Um, so just to say a little bit more about the city, um, these are two maps, one um, showing the racial segregation of the city and the other showing kind of the um, distribution of median household income in the city. Um, and they, you, can, you might be able to see that there's some, some overlap in what, what you see there. Um, so what the, the map on the left is showing, um, the green dots represent um, uh, black individuals, um, many of whom are concentrated in the, the west end of the city. Um, not only there, but you can see a couple of sort of fairly segregated spots. The, the white dots are um, white individuals, uh, the, the blue dots, rather. Um, and, and you can sort of see the, uh, a certain kind of pattern of, of segregation there. Um, and on the other map, again, the, the green rep rep represents the higher income, the red represents lower income. Um, people often talk about there being kind of a, a clockwise pattern in the distribution of wealth in Louisville. We're sort of starting at noon and going over. It's, it's the wealthiest, and then it goes down as you go, go around. But you can see kind of a, a fairly obvious division between the west side and the, the east side of the city. Um, so I want to start with thinking about um, compassion in relation to kind of these urban entrepreneurial discourses, um, compassion in relation to, to businesses, um, because that was something people were um, eager to talk to me about. 
actually. Um, and this was from the news article from the local public radio station. I just wanted to point to the, the first paragraph there. And the Ohio Valley is kind of a, the region that Louisville is in, just to, to clarify that. Um, it says that many towns and cities across the Ohio Valley try to improve the business environment, their business environments with tax breaks, site development, and other incentives. But how about investing in compassion? A growing body of science points to compassion as an economic driver, and more businesses and cities around the region are willing to give compassion a chance. Um, and so this link between compassion and economic development comes up a lot. Um, it's central to what the mayor, I think, was trying to do with this idea of the compassionate city. Um, he says, if people don't feel like they are interconnected and interdependent, and if people are not being invested in their human potential, you're not going to optimize your company, and you're certainly not going to optimize your city. So for me, a city is a platform for human potential to flourish. And that's my definition of compassion. Uh, he goes on to say, um, our focus on compassion is something that resonates worldwide and is so relevant in today's world. And I always welcome the chance to tell our city's story to potential investors and business interests that may be looking to expand in the US. Um, and even talking to folks who were not the mayor, who are not involved in city government, but who are involved in sort of this more grassroots um, compassion stuff, um, they would often bring this up about how important um, compassion could be in terms of the city's kind of economic future. Um, there are sort of stories circulating about, about businesses that would that had decided to locate in Louisville um, precisely because it was a compassionate place, for example. Um, so, so that's one, um, one thing that's happening. Um, and then I also want to say a little bit about another thing that I think that the city governments, the mayor, the sort of folks who are trying to um, have this compassion agenda in Louisville, um, that one other sort of angle on what's happening there. So in the Compassionate City Mission Statement, there's a couple of interesting um, things, and this was on the City of Louisville website. It was originally written in 2011. Um, they say with the Compassionate City, there is no political agenda. Um, the effort is solely designed to advance compassionate action and will have no opinion on outside issues. Um, and so it, be, it becomes difficult, um, of course, to sort of figure out what's, what's outside compassion. Um, but there is this refrain that compassion is not, not political um, is something that you sort of hear, um, hear over and over again, um, despite it again being kind of mobilized by uh, the top political official in the city um, to pursue their agenda. Um, so that's um, kind of a kind of a contradiction that I think is is important. And then when we'll think of come back to this question of um, the, the politics of this. Um, this was from an interview with a leader of the sort of more grassroots um, partnership for a compassionate Louisville, um, thinking about kind of how the organization was formed and what it was trying to do. Um, he said, we didn't want to be any kind of bottleneck or someone who judges in any way, shape or form. Um, in fact, one of our values was, was positivity. Um, and actually on the list of, of the values it said universal positivity. Um, and we didn't want to be in a position where there was something negative going on and compassion was kind of in the middle of it. So rephrasing or rethinking issues positively turned out to be really our only guiding force. And there's a couple of ways to see that in action. Um, this sort of preference for reframing things positively in the city. Um, and one was in a series of rallies that were organized over the course of the, the Trump years, um, that organized with the active involvement of the mayor's office and the, the Partnership for a Compassionate Louisville. Um, and so in most cities, after Donald Trump's inauguration, there was a, a weekend of protests, um, the Women's March. Um, in Louisville, um, they decided to have a rally called the, the Rally to Move Forward. Um, and so there was this, and again, this was sort of organized by the mayor's office, but it was sort of in the place where the protests would usually be. It was, they had managed to get a lot of the local organizations involved. 
um, that would have otherwise certainly been out protesting that day anyway. Um, and you saw something like this again happen after the introduction of um, the, the Muslim ban, um, where you had um, people kind of going out into the streets to protest, um, and the mayor sort of quickly put together a rally um, called the American Values Rally, um, that again was sort of um, trying to frame, trying to create this kind of positive, un uncontroversial um, framing that was sort of, again, these would have been occasions when people would have been going to the streets to protest anyway. They were all over the country. Louisville would not have been any different, uh, but this was a way for, to try to sort of, I, I would argue, to sort of try to channel, channel that energy in a particular way, to have some say in who is giving um, speeches from the stage, um, that, that, kind of, that kind of thing. And also to, to show at the same time that you were to doing, doing something in response to what was going, what was going on. Um, and there's also a sort of subtle way that the city's commitments to compassion could seem to sort of shield um, powerful actors from criticism. Um, this was from an activist in the city. Um, that's the other thing about compassion for me is that if, if I say or if someone says I'm compassionate, then you can't question me or challenge me on anything. The response being, that's not compassion. You questioning or challenging me is not compassionate. Um, so there's the sense that when compassion is sort of being claimed, then, then critiques of that person can be um, sort of brushed off as not, not sufficiently compassionate. Um, and that was something you could sort of see um, happening when, when people would, would criticize what the, what the city government was, was doing. Um, because despite the, the efforts to create this kind of universal positivity, um, things got, um, and to sort of, I forget what the, what the phrasing was, but to sort of where compassion wouldn't be mixed up with bad things, right? Um, it, 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 it got a little more complicated than that. Um, and in fact, throughout the time period since um, 2011, when these commitments to, to compassion were made, there has hardly been any kind of political issue or debate in the city um, that hasn't, um, hasn't invoked this, this commitment to compassion. Um, so you see this headline from the local newspaper, as Louisville gets rid of homeless camps, some wonder where is the compassionate city? Um, you would see people holding up signs um, saying, where is your compassion? People posting um, something um, awful that the city government was responsible for, a police shooting, one of the homeless encampments being torn down and people's possessions being destroyed, um, and sort of hashtagging it, compassionate city, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, this was from a letter, to, a letter to the editor of a local paper. Um, when Louisville Metro Council votes on the city budget on June 28, it will show whether we are a compassionate city or a police state. Um, and, and here the, the debate was about the, the level of funding for the police department um, and what that should, what that should look like. Um, again, there were, there were all sorts of political debates about raising the local minimum wage, all sorts of things that um, were discussed and debated in terms of the, the city's compassion or lack thereof. And groups working to pressure the city government to implement sanctuary policies um, that would discontinue cooperation with federal immigration authorities um, repeatedly invoked um, the compassionate city idea, suggesting that a compassionate city is a sanctuary city. Um, in contrast, the mayor would sort of suggest that the city didn't need to be a sanctuary city because it was already compassionate. Um, and in the, the summer of 2018, groups working together as part of a coalition called Occupy ICE, which ICE is the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. Um, so Occupy ICE set up a protest camp outside the, the federal building housing the local offices of ICE. Um, and they named the camp, um, camp Camp Compassion or Camp Compassion. It was often written in Spanish or talked about in Spanish. Um, and from this camp, which organizers wrote about as offering a, a model of radical love, hospitality, and resistance to all who build community with us, they advocated for abolishing ICE and put pressure on the mayor to declare the city a sanctuary city. 
Um, and so what's I think interesting here is that beyond kind of counter mobilizing this idea of the compassionate city in reaction to what the city was doing, um, this sort of push towards a more sort of substantive development of, of compassion um, that specifically includes kind of resistance to, to that which was seen as not being compassionate. Again, pushing back against the kind of universal positivity of the official compassion project. Um, and so, going to kind of end this section with um, a quote from a racial and economic justice activist that I interviewed, um, who offered kind of an alternative vision of what the compassionate, compassionate city might might mean. Um, and there's a reference here to the Ninth Street Divide, which is just kind of a local, a local vernacular for the patterns of sort of racial inequality and segregation in the city. Kind of Ninth Street runs down the middle of the city, dividing into east and west. Um, so the way in which we're going to address the Ninth Street Divide for me is going to say everything about whether or not we're truly a compassionate city. Until we really address the social and economic factors that divide east and west, we really won't get there. We've got to talk about employment, we've got to talk about income inequality, and we've got to talk about education. We've got to talk about all of these issues and, and act on them. Um, so, so here we see kind of um, something that you saw emerging over time, this kind of alternative vision of what's, um, what a compassionate city might look like that in a very real way kind of contrast with sort of the mayor's um, urban entrepreneurial agenda. Um, so I want to sort of pause here um, and think about a couple of questions and have you all um, spend some time talking with each other um, and then we'll kind of come back, come back together. Um, so the first question has to do with kind of thinking, sort of starting from this point of thinking about the compassionate city, but also thinking more broadly, um, what, what imaginaries of the urban good have you encountered um, in your own experiences? And so again, here I'm thinking about things like the idea of the sustainable city, the smart city, um, you may have others, um, th those kinds of things, have you encountered those and how would you characterize sort of the, the politics of those imaginaries? Um, and then two, is there anything from this account of the compassionate city in Louisville that you think might be useful for thinking about um, urban imaginaries, urban governance or politics elsewhere or ways that it might not be useful? Um, and the, the students who read, um, read the article probably have an advantage here than those of you who are just hearing me talk about this now. Um, but we'll spend about five minutes. Um, you can just talk with someone near you, um, sort of think about some responses to these questions, um, and then we'll, we'll come back together. All right, it's, it sounds like there's lots of good conversations happening. Um, but let's, let's go ahead and sort of come back, come back together. Um, so, so thinking about um, this first question about the, what kind of imaginaries of the urban bit have you encountered and, and how would you characterize the, the sort of politics of those of those imaginaries. Does anyone want to share what, what you all talked about? Thanks. What, what else do people talk about? I think that um, what the proponents of the compassionate city idea would probably say is that um, they sort of redefine compassion as something other than a feeling. Um, they talk about it as an action, or they talk about it as a, a sort of a disposition that can be cultivated. And we'll talk more about that in the, um, in the second bit here as this kind of disposition that can be cultivated in individuals that then sort of they have this idea of kind of scaling up from individuals to organizations to cities. Um, and, and so I think that that's kind of the, um, the way that, that advocates of this idea would respond to that. Um, for myself, 
I, I think there's a, a whole ton of questions um, about what happens when you're um, talking about um, sort of the, the a feeling or in relation to kind of a city. Um, although I think these other things like smartness and sustainability, those also come along with certain affective, um, certain sort of feeling components with those too, right? Um, and I think they are, they're meant to sort of make one feel a certain way, um, even if the, they don't refer to feelings themselves. Um, so I think that's also um, a part of it as well. And of course, those dynamics, those kind of colonial dynamics that you talk about um, are, are hugely, um, hugely important in terms of um, thinking about um, what's actually going on um, kind of in, in a city like, like Louisville or, or elsewhere. Um, so I think that's, that's super useful as well. Um, and, and compassion can be a way to, um, compassion talk or like all this sort of discourse about compassion can, can be a way of kind of ignoring those sorts of contexts, the colonial context, other kinds of contexts with different kinds of power relations involved. Other, other people have things they'd like to share. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's certainly the feeling I hear when people talk about Louisville as this model of compassion. <laughs> it's not, doesn't really describe the city that I, that I know. Um, but it's, but I, I think there's also something interesting about that kind of urge to sort of rank and measure um, that also some of the advocates of the Compassionate City Project are very much themselves um, trying to, they're, they're sort of invested in themselves and trying to work out um, there's a group of researchers at the University of Louisville who for, for years now have been working on developing a, a compassionate city index that's somehow meant to kind of somehow measure, um, measure compassion. Um, it, it's, it hasn't really gone anywhere as far as I've been able to find out. Um, but there is, and there's also all these sort of competitions amongst these cities where they sort of try to um, show who's most compassionate um, married and uh, measured in various kinds of ways. Um, so that's um, something that um, the people who are sort of involved in this project are, um, they do want to sort of measure um, and kind of they're invested in this kind of extrospective kind of uh, project of comparison and relation amongst other, other cities. Um, but yeah. Other, other things. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that, that, that kind of connects with that question about sort of the difficulty of talking about sort of feelings, um, which you might associate with sort of individuals having versus kind of a, a collective sort of thing, right? Um, but I think that there is a sort of a, a tendency and we'll add actually sort of a theme in the next part of the lecture, sort of this specific focus on, on individuals um, and kind of what that, what that tells us or what that leads to. Um, anyone, I don't know if it's sort of anything from the second question there, I think they kind of, they kind of go together, but are there other, other things that people would like to, to mention? If not, and if there aren't, this is also maybe a good time just if there are any other questions that you all might have before I kind of dive, dive back in. All right, so in this next segment, um, we're going to be talking about um, 
kind of a slightly different approach and a, a different set of um, sort of data that I'm that I'm working with. Um, that I've sort of characterized here as, as problematizing compassion. Um, but but what I'm actually sort of interested in is kind of looking at the the problems that that compassion advocates um, see compassion as a solution to. So sort of whereas in the first part I was thinking about a lot how sort of people outside the kind of official compassion project were sort of contesting it, reworking it, um, that kind of thing. Um, here I'm interested in how people who are themselves sort of advocating these um, compassionate city projects, um, how they understand the, the problems that these projects are meant to be addressing um, and how they think about kind of compassion as a, as a solution to those problems. Um, and when I talk about Louisville, I, I tend to, in the compassionate city in Louisville, I tend to get fairly um, paranoid in the kind of um, Eve Sedgwick sort of sense of um, kind of offer, tending to offer kind of paranoid critique. Um, and, and in this um, in this section, I'm kind of following from Lauren Berlant's writing on compassion, um, where she suggests that we, we need not assume that sentiments of compassion are at root ethically false, destructive, or sadistic, just that they derive from social training, emerge at historical moments, and take place in scenes that are anxious, volatile, surprising, and contradictory. Um, and, and again, so this this what I'm drawing on here is interviews um, and to some extent um, participant observation at um, sort of gatherings of compassionate city proponents. Um, I went to several of these sort of international conferences um, right before the pandemic and then I attended some online after the pandemic. Um, and, and so and that's often where I would meet people from lots of different cities and, and do interviews, um, interviews with them as well. Um, so we're going to kind of move away from Louisville specifically for this part um, and sort of hear from people from a, quite a few different different places. And again, sort of thinking about um, what it is that they're trying to do kind of from their own, um, their own perspective. Um, and I'm going to talk about three sets of, of problems. And I don't make any claim that these are the only problems that the compassionate city advocates are interested in. In fact, if you look at any, if you look at the International Charter for Compassion website, if you look at any specific sort of compassionate city organization, you often have kind of a laundry list of like 20 different issues or problems that they're concerned with. Um, but what I've tried to pick out here are kind of the three, I think, most sort of distinctive, um, distinctive problems, um, problems where um, a certain understanding of, of compassion and what it is, is is playing a particular kind of role. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to, um, to bring out here. Um, and these are not necessarily like the traditional kind of problems you would see talked about, so maybe the last one a little bit, in the kind of a um, urban studies or urban geography. Although th those, again, those issues do get talked about, issues around housing, issues around migration, issues around racism. Um, all those kinds of things come up um, amongst compassion advocates, but I'm, I'm focusing here on sort of these three um, ways in which these, what people are after is a little bit distinctive, a little bit different, um, a little, and sort of more unique to the compassion project, I think. Um, and so the first one I'm going to talk about are a, a, actually a constellation of of different sort of problems that are actually joined more by their, by their solution, which is the sort of attempt to um, cultivate compassion as this kind of um, individual disposition that can be trained, um, that can be sort of um, worked on, um, that then is meant to solve either kind of individual or sort of organizational problems, issues around stress, of productivity in the workplace, um, those kinds of those kinds of issues. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, um, compassionate city advocates are often drawing on various kinds of scientific discourse um, and thinking about what they're what they're up to. Um, this is um, someone I talked to from Australia. Um, and, and sometimes I use countries, to, and sometimes I name the specific city. Uh, usually I'm using countries where there's like 
one person who's known in that city and it would sort of be giving away who they were if I, if I said the, the city. Um, so, so here, um, it's talking about Paul Gilbert, who's a, a psychologist, um, and the, the understanding of these sort of three emotion regulation systems, our threat and survival systems, our drive and achievement, and our soothing and affiliation. Um, she said, we don't have to do anything for our drive and our threat systems to turn up. They, they already come out of their, their evolutionary. Um, and so we evolved to look out for threats and to get up and get ourselves out and go and do. Um, what needs training is soothing, is our soothing and affiliation system. And that can happen in mindfulness practices in meditation, in self-compassion, in deep listening. There are lots of ways in which we can access our soothing system. Um, so for, for this person, um, the advocating for the, a compassionate city was largely about kind of finding context in which to, to introduce these ideas about compassion and to sort of find ways to kind of train or cultivate this compassion, cultivate this sort of sense of compassion in in people, in institutions, um, in, um, say, schools or hospitals or different kinds of um, parts of a, of a city, maybe in, in some cases in the city government itself. Um, you, you've seen the various kinds of these um, trainings given, say, to, to bureaucrats in, in a municipal government. Um, this was from someone from San Antonio talking about a program that they were running with um, educators, people working mostly in the local public school system. Um, so co cohorts of, of teachers and others working in the schools would meet once a month for an hour, um, and they're all trying to integrate what they've learned into work or at home, and at the end we did a case study on it. Um, one of the biggest outcomes in the case study, um, for, and for the entire year from those educators, the bottom line is that they could not have survived that year without what they learned in the institute. And that was personally and professionally. There were countless stories of how the practices kept them alive and breathing um, and coming together and community support. Um, and this is kind of in the context of the, the pandemic. Um, it's kind of what's in the background of what they're, what they're talking about um, here. But again, this was this effort to sort of run this, it's called a compassion integrity training um, with um, educators in the local, local school system. Um, speaking to someone from Monterrey in Mexico, um, talking about their um, certification for compassionate businesses. Um, and she says that the, the initiative started because we wanted to get um, businesses involved in the exercise of compassion um, to help us create a more fair economy um, so that levels of stress and anxiety could be reduced. Um, we've developed a whole manual that includes the, the processes that a company needs to follow in order to get a certification. Um, so mainly the process has three steps. The first one is a, a session that coaches did for the leadership team in order to sensitize them in compassion. Then the second is a training for the second level managers and supervisors um, when they become ambassadors of compassion inside the company. Um, and the third step is to collaborate in a project with the community. So once the, once the company sends us evidence for these internal and external compassion actions for at least six months, they receive the certification. Um, and, and so this is uh, something that comes up a lot. There are various kinds of certificates floating around. Um, again, maybe this kind of goes in with the way that people are trying to make um, this sort of subjective um, compassion idea more concrete at one level. Um, and there's, there's a lot that one could sort of unpack, um, unpack here, I think. Um, but again, this is sort of one example of the, the kind of, of program that, that folks involved in this are, are offering. And again, these, all, all of these that I've talked about so far are sort of are very much aimed at this kind of individual training that then maybe sort of scales up in some fashion, either to, to an organization or ultimately the, the ideas to the, the city as a, as a whole. Um, a, a second set of problems and solutions um, have to do with um, societal assumptions about competition and selfishness. Um, so in some way, this is sort of compassion as a kind of intellectual project um, where, where advocates are sort of trying to challenge what they see as sort of the prevailing, um, prevailing assumptions that, that human beings are 
um, competitive and selfish, um, and they offer compassion as this kind of um, pro-social um, pro-social capacity um, that sort of and often drawing on kind of evolutionary psychology that sort of um, inherent in the the human um, species um, as something that they then use to again kind of challenge this um, idea that humans are inherently um, selfish, competitive, they sort of, you often hear them sort of critiquing a sort of survival of the fittest mentality, um, that sort of, um, that sort of thing. So again, they sort of see, they imagine, they sort of talk about other people having this kind of faulty understanding of human nature, uh, and, and that's sort of the, the problem to be addressed by introducing this kind of account of, of compassion as this, again, this kind of pro-social inherent um, aspect of, of the human species. Um, and again, there's a, a number of different kind of scientific discourses that are, that are drawn on to make this, make this point. Um, we have a quote kind of somewhere like, it's really the scarcity mindset that we have to get beyond. Um, this is from, as part of this, I was also looking at kind of the, um, the examples of the, the discourses that people were drawing on. So if people mentioned certain books or certain things, I would, I would go read them myself. Um, and this was a quote from the, um, the Oxford Handbook of Compassion Science, which was recommended to me several times, um, from James Doty, who's a um, medical doctor at Stanford who has sort of started um, the Stanford Center for Altruism and some, something, Compassion and Altruism, um, and has written several sort of popular science books about compassion. Um, and anyway, here he says, many have misunderstood Charles Darwin's view of natural selection as a justification for the necessity of aggressive or ruthless behavior. Um, over the last three decades, what has become evident is that compassion, characterized by nurturing and caring behavior, is critical to the long-term survival of many species, and most importantly, perhaps, to the human species. So this is the kind of, the kind of project that we're, we're talking about. Um, so again, there's this um, sort of intellectual problem that people see them as, as addressing and offering um, compassion as, as an alternative. Um, and then a thing that came up almost as much was the idea that compassion would be some kind of solution to the problem of, of political polarization. Um, sometimes just political polarization, sometimes including a specific em emphasis on kind of the populist or authoritarian right wing, um, sometimes kind of not really making a distinction between right and left, sometimes sort of focus more on the right, particularly in the context of, of the US and Donald Trump, that was often kind of the, the, the aim of this. But so there's this, this sense in which compassion then, as this kind of disposition, is something that can promote civility, um, build bridges of various kinds across difference, um, and, and sort of address this sort of polarized feeling, um, and sort of bring the, bring the temperature down on um, political conflicts. Um, and there was just a, a webinar um, thinking about compassion and its role in, in this kind of polarized environment. Um, and so I'm gonna show a kind of a long quote next that's divided across two different slides. Um, and it is um, from someone from Seattle, which was um, actually one of the first cities to sort of um, start talking about itself as the compassionate city, although it didn't really stick there in the way it did in Louisville. It was kind of something that happened for a few months and then seemed to, um, no one talked about it anymore after that. But there are still people in, um, in Seattle who are sort of involved with this um, compassion group. And so I was talking to one of them and he said, so today, um, the New York Times front page, it says that right wing, you know, white supremacist nationalists have caused 75% of the terrorist attacks in the last 10 years and the authorities are completely unprepared to deal with it. Yesterday, the New York Times talked about the rise of left-wing gun rights, gun groups, so the left-wing groups are arming themselves with guns across the country. I think the role, and I'll speak personally, my role is to stay and model the center, right? Um, and modeling the center doesn't mean namby-pamby, kumbaya, everybody's one, um, but a lot of the language we hear, there's nothing wrong with that language, but the reality of it is that, I mean, I, I wanna say, you know, this is war, fuck you, right? Um, you know, I have that response too. 
Um, but I have to really keep myself to the center and say, no, my role is to model being as steady as I can, um, being as steady as we can, so that people can see that it's possible to disagree in a civil way, that it's possible to resist in a non nonviolent way. And so, yes, I think resistance is appropriate and needed, and sometimes tough love is needed, and compassion can be tough love, and tough love is painful, right? It can leave you in tears, it can lead you to all kinds of breakdowns, and that's sometimes necessary. Um, so I'll say holding the center is the hardest thing to do. It's easy to fall into the extremes, and right now that's what's happening. And, and so there's a lot going on um, in this quote. Um, there's kind of this appeal to the, the center, right? And it's both, I think, a kind of political center um, and a kind of affective center um, in the sense that um, there is throughout this the Compassionate City projects, this kind of political centrism, and I, and I think that's, that's visible here um, in a way, but there's also kind of an aspect of um, emotional or, or affective um, kind of um, centrism as well. So a sense of sort of avoiding extremes um, in a lot of different senses and sort of the, the role of, of compassion um, in, in making, that, making that possible. So thinking about these problems and solutions, um, a few kind of takeaways for me from that. Um, so for many of the compassionate city proponents, the, the problems and their solutions can be found in sort of individual attitudes and patterns of thought, um, and to an extent kind of organizations, systems, or, or cities that are approached with a kind of scaled up collection of individuals. Um, compassion as a kind of pro-social individualism provides for many people a kind of compelling middle ground to what they see as a kind of outdated survival of the fittest style capitalism. And also, um, and this is sometimes mentioned, sometimes not, um, to more kind of critical oppositional forms of left politics. Um, so for people who are interested in that kind of middle ground, compassion becomes, this compassion project becomes one, one way to do it. Um, and this also this construction of the, the problem of polarization towards which compassion is imagined as a response, I think can risk directing attention away from, um, from the actual content of the political questions towards which people are um, polarized um, and can also tend to sort of devalue specific forms of comportment and affects, right? So not being too extreme, um, being sort of measured and um, embodying compassion in that way. Um, and, and so I think there's a, a real danger with the, with the approach to, to polarization there. And so I'm going to begin to conclude here with some reflections on the, the possibilities of, of abolishing compassion. And I, I'm playing around a little bit with the phrasing um, there. Um, and on the one hand, I think that the sort of the, the version of the compassionate city that's sort of taken up by powerful city politicians and, and philanthropic elites um, does probably need to be abolished along with the, the structures that it supports. Um, and on the other hand, I don't really think, I think compassion in a more general sense is probably sort of too big and varied a thing to really want to abolish it. Um, and in even the compassionate city, I think the, the, the meaning of the compassionate city is not sort of fully set. Um, there, different kinds of things might be possible, um, only possible, I would say. Um, and so to do that, I want to go back to Louisville for a second, uh, to an event that has some important implications for thinking about the compassionate city, although it's important for so many reasons beyond that. Um, and this was the police killing of Breonna Taylor. Um, and so after midnight on March 13th, 2020, um, officers of Louisville's Compassionate Police Department, um, in plain clothes but fully armed, um, used a so-called no-knock warrant to forcefully enter Breonna Taylor's home. Um, roused out of their bed by this invasion, Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, um, Kenneth Walker, responded to what he assumed was a, a home invasion. I had this all written out nicely, and then I... Um, so Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, responded to what, is, what he assumed was a home invasion by firing a single warning shot from his licensed weapon. Um, in response, the Compassionate City's police department um, fired at least 32 bullets, um, eight of which struck Breonna Taylor, killing her. 
um, there were some immediate protests in response, um, even in kind of the initial um, confusion of conflicting accounts and stories of police self-defense. Um, those protests would grow over time as some of the initial fog around um, the event cleared and, and new revelations cast doubt on the police's own version of events. Um, meanwhile, a couple of months later, um, the, um, the murder of George Floyd um, hit national news, um, sparking kind of a, a wave of, of protest across the country and, and elsewhere in the world as well. Um, and the Breonna Taylor case was sort of a, a local anchoring point throughout that summer. Um, and so for some people, this was a chance to kind of um, argue for a number of reforms, um, do, doing away with those no-knock warrants that, that were part of the story that led to, led to this. Um, others sort of operating from an abolitionist perspective um, were able to sort of um, work that summer to sort of build the movement to abolish policing and prisons more generally, um, which is something that abolitionists have been working on for decades. Um, but in the summer of 2020 was uh, a moment in which abolitionist principles and politics entered into mainstream political conversation um, in a way that would have been unimaginable before. And all, all the time, the compassionate city government, which is implicated in this in lots of ways, again, the police department is part of the city government, um, and there are other, other things I'll talk about, um, doesn't really have anything to, to offer in response. Um, and thanks to the work of the, the Root Cause Research Center, which is kind of a unique research organizing collective in Louisville, um, there's now kind of a, a clearer image of the, the racial capitalist political economies that sort of set the stage for Breonna Taylor's murder. Um, and they, they put out a report called Property and Policing in Louisville. Um, and, and in that report, they, they present kind of a, a complicated and, and detailed account of changes in local government ordinances and police practices that set the stage for, for what happened to, to Taylor. Um, and this had to do with expansions of the city's public nuisance ordinance um, that was increasingly being used to evict people from their homes and sort of make properties available for redevelopment, um, as well as um, a thing called place-based investigation practices, for the local police force, um, which I sort of think of as kind of the broken windows theory on steroids, but it's, it's sort of a, um, a way of sort of heightening um, enforcement and surveillance in particular neighborhoods as well as in um, places that are connected to those neighborhoods. Um, so for example, Breonna Taylor's home um, was not in one of these neighborhoods, but it was caught up and sort of connected to one of these neighborhoods as if because they, they had an acquaintance that went back and forth between the houses. Um, and so then that became the basis for the no-knock warrant um, that led to um, Breonna Taylor's killing. Um, and so, again, I'm sort of talking about this to highlight the political economy kind of behind what happened and the, the lack of, of response from the compassionate city government, which basically just offered to investigate, um, eventually fired the, the three of the officers involved. Um, but that was after like a year or so. Um, so there, there wasn't really anything um, that the that the city government did in, in response to this. And you also sort of just anecdotally notice the kind of all the talk about compassion kind of goes away um, on both, both the activists who had kind of been making demands on the city before, um, but also from the kind of mayor's office themselves um, that after, after this summer, you don't really hear um, the compassion talk in Louisville like you did. It's still on the sign at the airport, you find it on a website, um, but, but something sort of shifted um, with, with, this, um, with the summer of 2020. And so now to sort of actually conclude, um, I sort of put back those, those three problems that I, that I had before are sets of problems. And again, often after the end of a, a research project, one makes various kinds of policy recommendations or, or different things. And I suppose these are my own sorts of recommendations um, of ways that one might, might do compassion differently or um, do something else other than, than compassion that, that are sort of connected to those um, 
those initial um, problems. Um, one, they're sort of drawing on feminist care ethics, um, thinking about ways to, to cultivate care um, collectively, thinking about ways to um, challenge kind of the, the individualistic model of the um, of so much of the compassionate city project. Um, in relation to the societal assumptions about competition and selfishness, um, I think there's an opportunity there both to challenge um, kind of discourses and practices around so-called conscious capitalism, which, which some of this compassionate city stuff is, is bound up with, this sort of capitalism that's imagined to be beyond the kind of survival of the fittest, but still capitalism. Um, and I think a need to sort of challenge that. Um, and then even from within the kind of um, official compassion project, there's interest in kind of contesting sort of punitive notions of justice um, that, that lead to, uh, they're tied up with kind of the um, mass, mass incarceration um, and the issues with policing and prisons, um, sort of people seeing compassion as, as a way to, um, to develop other ways of thinking um, about justice or alternatives to that sort of punitive form of justice. Um, and then in relation to sort of political polarization, um, I think there's a, a real danger in kind of framings of extremism as a problem um, and, and a need to sort of actually focus on the, the, the content of what's at stake. Um, and also kind of a, a hesitance about the, the universal positivity of the um, of the Compassionate City Project and sort of, I think, a need to sort of risk polarization um, to actually do, do anything that's worth doing. Um, and so that's sort of where I'm, where I'm left with in, in thinking about the, the Compassionate City. Um, and again, I've, I've meant this to be kind of something that um, one could use to look at lots of different things besides just the Compassionate City, again, this these approaches of sort of politicizing or, or thinking about these problems and solutions um, or, or thinking about what's a kind of abolitionist um, approach that sort of rethinks the entire coordinates of the racial capitalist system in which we're embedded, um, what that might look like. Um, and so hopefully that would be useful for you all in some way. Um, but I'll go ahead and stop there and see if there are questions or, or things you all would like to ask.